Good morning. Welcome to Faith Baptist Church and a special welcome to those of you that are joining us virtually this morning. We love you and we miss you. Just a couple of quick announcements. First, in the pew in front of you is a card that looks like this. This is a connect card, a connect card. And if you're joining us virtually, you can find the same connect card um, on the church's website and on the church's YouTube page. And if you're a visitor here with us today, we would encourage you to fill out this connect card so that we have a record of your attendance with us today. And if you're a member or a regular attender, we would encourage you to please use this to let us know of any questions, any comments, uh, any concerns you may have, or any prayer needs that you may have. And we will be very prompt to reply to you. There will be a youth quencher tonight, a youth quencher tonight for grades 7 through 12. This will be at the Westbergs home, and the bus will leave the church at approximately 7 p.m. immediately following Sunday school, and will return at about 9.30 p.m. And we have a business meeting coming up. Our quarterly business meeting will be next Sunday evening at 7.15, right here in the uh, main sanctuary. And uh, that also will be immediately following the Sunday school time. The Flamingos. The Flamingos, of course, is our ministry for those who have lost spouses. The Flamingos have an event that is coming up on Saturday, November the 7th. They will be traveling to Mount Dora, Mount Dora, for a premier boat tour and lunch at Lakeside End. And again, that is Saturday, November the 7th. The bus will leave the church at 9 a.m. The cost is $36 per person. The cost is $36. But if the cost is an issue, please come see me. We will take care of that. If you're a widow or a widower, you need to go to this. This will be a great time of fun, food, and fellowship, and we do not want to let $36 stand in the way of you going to that event. And then finally, October. Who can tell me what October is? Pastor Appreciation Month, and we are blessed at Faith Baptist Church with our pastoral staff. Amen? Amen. I would encourage you this month to send a card of encouragement or to stop Pastor Topman or, or Pastor Smith or Pastor Stephen and tell them how much you love them and appreciate what they're doing. And kind of along those same lines, next weekend is moving weekend for both Pastor Topman and his family and the Osborne family as well. Pastor Topman will be moving into his new home and the, top, uh, excuse me, the Osbournes will be moving out of their old home. So we are asking for any able-bodied men and women to uh, sign up to help with those moves. So if you're physically able, and if you have a truck or if you have a trailer, that would be awesome as well. There's lots of boxes and stuff that need to be moved. You can either see Brother Mitran Lisby, who's sitting over here to my right. You can call him, you can text him, you can see him face to face, or you can call the church office and we will be happy to put you to work. Thank you very much. God bless you. Good morning. Good morning. This morning, I would like to teach you a new song. It is called Christ, Our Hope in Life and Death. It's, it kind of came out around Easter of this year. If you watched any of our, our family hymn sings that we did earlier this year, we sang this song on one of those videos. And um, so I've asked my family to help me this morning to sing it. And so we're going to sing verse 1 in the chorus, and then I'm going to invite you to stand with me, and we'll go back to verse 1 and sing through the song together. Fair enough? And um, this is really to prepare our hearts for the service this morning and for the message from God's Word. This morning we're going to be looking at the Abrahamic covenant and, uh, and what the covenant between God and man that he made. So... Listen and then join us as we sing. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? That our souls to Him belong. Who holds our days within His hand? What comes upon? will keep us to the end, the love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we can 
with us and sing with us. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? That our souls to Him belong. Who holds our days within His hand? What comes apart from His command? And what will He about that a lot this week, and it's led me to this next song that says, Behold Our God. And I chose this song to really help us think about the kind of God it is that would make a covenant like he made. So I invite you to sing with me one of our favorite songs here at our church this morning. Who has held the ocean
Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day that we're able to gather here today. Thank you for those that are, are not able to gather this morning, but are able to watch from home. Lord, I thank you for those in our church that have been able to come home from the hospital. Think of Carl Singer. I ask you to continue to, to bless him and continue to um, help him recover. I pray for the, the Dumpke family, for Greg and Connor. I thank you that they are home from the hospital. And I pray that you'd help them to continue to recover. Lord, I pray for the Wright family this morning, for James Wright, David Wright's son. Lord, we know that he is near death, Lord. We ask that you would continue to um, give the doctors wisdom in their care for him. I pray that you would give the family um, your peace, Lord, as they go through this hard time. Lord, I thank you for Walt Henry. Pray that you would increase his strength and his mobility as he is um, continuing to recover. Lord, with, with everything that's going on in the world, I ask you to continue to give us your peace and your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Just before our pastor comes, let's stand again and sing, He Leadeth Me. Still tis God's hand that lead 
Good morning, church. Good morning. In December of 2015, our family enjoyed a Christmas gathering up in north central Wisconsin. And uh, it, was, it was a great time together as a family uh, with, uh, with my wife, with Honora's family. We rented a big cabin on a campground and enjoyed a fire and played games together and um, took walks in the woods. There was snow, so we got to do some sledding. And uh, that, the, the following summer, so the summer of 2016, was to be uh, Honora's father. We affectionately called him Pop Pop. It was to be his retirement. And so a lot of our conversations uh, that Christmas were around some of his upcoming projects, the gardening that he wanted to do, the trips that he wanted to take with Grammy, and it was a great, it was a great Christmas together. Well, uh, in about February of that year, Pop Pop began to get sick, and it was about March that we learned that he had stage four pancreatic cancer. And uh, you fast forward a few months, and uh, he did retire, but not in the way that he wanted or the way that we imagined, right? And uh, we got to see him that summer, but there wasn't any gardening. He was too sick. There weren't any trips. And then in October, he took his final trip to heaven. And, you know, the emotions that surround these times in our lives are intense. And I know a lot of us in our church family, we're, we're fighting or we're walking through these emotional waters right now, aren't we? Yes. And, um, and you ask questions of God, and we... We don't want to be disrespectful, but, but our hearts cry out to God. And I think that they're legitimate questions. Honora and I, as missionaries, we know Christ's commands. And, and you know, Christ in Matthew chapter 10, verse 37, what did he say? He said, those of you that love mother or father more than me are not worthy of me. So as missionaries, you're on the field and you're going, do we come back? Do we come back to see Papa? Do we come back for the funeral? Or is that not loving God more than family, right? And you wrestle with those, and then you feel guilty as a child. Are you not supporting your family? Those are real emotions. And you ask questions like, is it fair? Why this timing? Papa was right at the edge of retirement, and he was looking forward to spending extra time with his wife. And in hobbies that he, was, that he enjoyed and was looking forward to, he had worked hard for so long. And you ask questions, God, how, how are you good in this? How is this fair? How is this right? Those are real questions. I'm, I'm just opening up Honora in my life to you this morning, right? We, and we ask those questions, why is this happening, God? And we can even ask the question, where are you, God, in this? This is a mess. What are you doing in this mess? And that may be where you are this morning. Maybe not, but I'm suspicious that a number of us are in this moment, whether it's something uh, that's, that's a physical loss that you've experienced recently, or maybe just even the, the situation that we find ourselves in right now with the, the election or the pandemic. I think a lot of people are asking this question, where are you, God? What are you doing in this mess right now? Well, the answer we find in our text today is a game changer. Make no mistake, church. These three verses that we are going to study today, they cannot, they must not be overlooked in our understanding of God and in our walk with him. John Stott said this of Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. These are perhaps the most unifying verses in the Bible. The whole of God's purpose is encapsulated here. Let me read that quote again. That's a a major quote. He says of Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. These are perhaps the most unifying verses in the Bible, in the Bible. The whole of God's purpose is encapsulated here. So we can see in these three verses God's character and his plan. Pastor Simpson just led us in a song, Behold Our God. He's been reflecting on this and asking, what kind of God would make a covenant like this? 
And so we can see his character and we can see his plan in these verses. These verses answer this question, where are you, God? They answer it directly and they answer it powerfully. So how did we get here? How did we get to Genesis chapter 12? Well, in Genesis 1, we began our Game Changer series two weeks ago. And we were introduced to a creator God who formed the universe by his words. And then he created man and woman in his image. We carry the imprint of the divine. We are the work of an artist and we are meant to reflect that artist with our lives. We are meant to be his image bearers. But last week, we came to Genesis chapter 3, didn't we? And in Genesis chapter 3, all of that changed. Adam and Eve rebelled against God, and we rebelled with them. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says this, Therefore, just as through one man, Adam, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. We are all sinners. And Pastor Osborne said it so eloquently last week. We fell so far. We can't even see or know or understand what an uncursed universe could look like. Just imagine. What could an uncursed marriage or an uncursed work or an uncursed pregnancy B. We can't even fathom it. Well, that leads us to this interlude. We're going to look at Genesis 12 today. We ended with Genesis chapter 3 last week. So what happens in Genesis 4 to 11? Well, we see mankind trying to find their own way. We see generations of people rebelling against God until he needs to bring a flood. He destroys everyone except Noah and his family. And then we have more generations culminating in gathering at a tower, attempting to make a great name for themselves. We see that at the beginning of chapter 11. We call it the Tower of Babel. And what does God do? God scatters those people. And chapter 11 concludes with the descendants of a man named Terah. We learn at the very end of chapter 11 in verse 27 that Abram is Terah's son. And we need to remember the context that Abram is born into. The context is things are a total mess. Man is trying to, to make something of himself, make a name for himself. And God scatters them. The, the languages, are, now, they're, now they can't speak to each other. They're scattering all over the world. Mankind is prideful. They're selfish. They're self-absorbed. Sounds a lot like our world today, doesn't it? We're all over YouTube and whatever else trying to make a name for ourselves. We want to be influencers so people will buy our stuff. Well, the introduction of Abram into the game at this point is going to change everything. He's a rookie. He's an undrafted free agent. He is a no name. No one knows him. He's a total unknown at this point. Okay, he's being put into the game. No one knows who this guy is, what he's capable of, what's going to happen, right? But through Abram, God will begin to reverse everything that's gone wrong in chapters 1 to 11. The question that we're asking this morning is, where are you, God? How are you going to fix this mess? So let's see what happens. I invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 12. If you haven't already, Genesis chapter 12. And as you find it, if you will, go ahead and stand. This is, a, this is a short passage, so why don't we stand together as a church as I read it this morning. Genesis chapter 12. And I'm going to begin at verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Father, we confess 
that we take our eyes off of you and we look at the circumstances around us and we doubt, we question you. Father, I confess that this morning. We confess that this morning. That we don't know you well enough. We don't keep our eyes fixed on you in the way that we should. And so, Father, as we open up your word and you're revealing yourself to us this morning, please help us to see you more clearly. And God, I'm asking today, especially as we look at how you called and blessed Abram, Father, please help us to listen to your own calling in our lives. And Father, please help us to, to hear you and help us to respond to you. Father, you please do the work in us this morning. And it's in your precious son's name we come to you. Amen. You may be seated. So our big question today is, where are you, God? And the answer that we find in Genesis chapter 1 to 3 is this. God is calling and he's blessing. Now, you may be thinking, okay, thanks a lot, Pastor Dave. I, I have no idea what that actually means. I'm asking the question, where is God in this mess? And you answer, he's calling and he's blessing. Well, you're in the right place. If you see this answer and you say, I actually don't know how that's helpful to me, stay with me. Over the next few minutes, we're going to look at how this plays out and how God's intervention through Abram is a game changer. Not just for Abram, not just for the nation of Israel, but it's a game changer for the world. And it includes you and me this morning. We need to understand how... God engaged with Abram, and then what that reveals about him and about his plan, all right? So the first thing that we need to understand about our text, about our passage this morning, is that there are two commands in it. Now, the first one is really obvious to us. It says, now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, and you or your version may say, go, or it may say, leave. That's obvious. We can see that in English, all right? And maybe you've said those words before, to an animal or to a child, or to an employee, leave, get out, go. That's a command, right? The second command is less obvious. If you look farther down at the end of verse 2, we can see this phrase, you shall be a blessing. Now, in English, that's not as obvious, but this is also a command. This is an imperative verb. Some versions will say, and you will be a blessing. In English, we can understand this to say, uh, if you say to a child, you will do the dishes, right? So we, <laughs> so we understand this can be a command as well. Now, these two commands help us to understand the structure of what God is saying here in Genesis chapter 12. So let's look at it with these two commands as our pivot points. First of all, he says to Abram, get out, go, leave, and he says, to a land that I will show you. Now, in growing up and reading these verses, uh, they, this part is what struck me the most. Excuse me just a moment, I'm sorry. Pop-pop is getting to me. In, in reading these verses as a child, this part just jumped off the page to me that God says to Abram, go, and then I will show you. That's incredible to me. And it's even more incredible, Abram obeyed. That's exactly what he did. And, and the key here is, Abram had to take that first step of obedience. He had to begin to obey God. And God said, I will show you, but you have to obey me first. All right? Just, it's just amazing. And Abram followed him. Well, what does God give Abram to do? Abram has three tasks. God says to him, leave, go. And he says, leave what? Leave your country. That's the land. That's what he's familiar with. He's saying to Abram, go away from the place that, it, that has everything that's familiar to you. This would be like saying to us, go away from... Chick-fil-A and go away from Andy's Igloo and go away from Starbucks. Go to a land where everything is different. 
Leave what you're familiar with. And then he says, leave your family. This is his extended family. This is the place that he is born. Some versions use the word kindred. We have some big, strong families in our church. This is telling Abram, you need to leave your Thanksgiving traditions. You need to leave your Christmas gatherings. You need to leave your family. You're moving away from it. You're not going to be able to fly home for the weekend. And then thirdly, he says to him, from your father's house. This is even his close family. And one commentator explained, this is really Abram's inheritance. This is his social security program. He's saying, leave your retirement plan. What, what God is doing here is he's, he's saying, he goes from general, your, your country, your nation, and he goes all the way down to your close family. And he's saying to Abram, leave everything that is your security, everything that is familiar. I want your complete and undivided allegiance. I want you to depend completely on me. He, he, he wants Abraham or Abram to leave all of his comforts and security. That's tough. That is tough. Well, he doesn't just leave him alone in this, though. He gives him these three tasks, but then he makes three promises. Look at what he says. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great. Well, what do these mean? Well, he's starting to show a contrast here with what has been happening in, verses, in chapters 1 through 11. Look at this last one. He says, I will make you a great nation. Now, Abram and Sarai don't have any children yet. So this is a little fuzzy what this means. He says, I will bless you. Now that blessing, we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit greater detail in a moment. But that blessing does include both material blessing and spiritual blessing. All right, And then he says, I will make your name great. Remember in chapter 11, verse 4, the people of the world were trying to make their name great by building the tower. And God is now showing the contrast to that and saying, mankind can't make their own names great, but I can. I can make something of you. All right. So God is saying, I'm going to lead. I will provide for you. You're going to leave everything, but I'm going to provide. And he says, I will bless you. I will take care of you. Everything that mankind couldn't do, God can. Okay, so that's the first command. Go, get out. The second command is be a blessing. He says, you shall be a blessing. And then he launches into three more promises. He says, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And then he says, I will, or in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He's saying, I will bless all the families, all the nations of the earth through you. So, in the first one, he said, get out. We had Abram's tasks and then God's promises. Now he has, you need to be a blessing, and we have God's promises. So the natural question is, okay, so what are Abram's tasks? There are no tasks for Abram in this. Look, at, he, he says, you be a blessing, and I'm going to bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you, and I'm going to bless all the peoples of the earth through you. There's no task for Abram. Now, why is that important? Well, what is happening here is this is the introduction of what we know as the Abrahamic covenant. And the Abrahamic covenant is explained. It's, it's given greater detail and nuance and, and understanding in the next 10 chapters, especially Chapters 15 and 17. And what God is doing is he's introducing to Abram how he's going to take care of him. And he says that there's three parts to the, the Abrahamic covenant. He's promising to Abram that he will give him land. And that land is going to be the physical nation of Israel. He also says to him he will give him descendants. We use the word seed. Pastor Osborne used it last week. When we're studying the book of Genesis, we must, we must understand this word seed is a significant word. Those that did not respect and they did not honor God's desire for descendants, God actually killed people in the book of Genesis because they were not taking care of the seed. And then finally, we have this blessing. And I mentioned a moment ago, this is both material and it's spiritual. Think about Abram. God blessed Abram materially in significant ways, didn't he? If we read these next 10 chapters, there's actually a section 
when we read through this, you go, is this for real? Abram has a personal army. Do you remember this? He has 318 trained soldiers. This guy is wealthy. They have, he has so many flocks. He has so many servants. It actually creates issues with other farmers in the area. So does God bless Abram materially? Absolutely. But he also blesses him spiritually. And he blesses him spiritually, ultimately, because Jesus Christ is born through Abram's line. And Jesus is the one that brings the offer of salvation, redemption, forgiveness. Jesus is the one that's going to crush the serpent's head and reverse the curse that we heard about last week. And so there is material blessing, but there's spiritual blessing coming to Abram as well. So here's why this is so significant, that there's a promise, but there's not actually tasks in this second part. When we look at this, it seems like it's conditional, that God's promising something to Abram, but Abram needs to do all this work. But actually, as God reveals the Abrahamic covenant to him in 12, 13, 14, 15, 17, we learn that this covenant is unconditional. God is making a promise to Abram, and he's saying, I will do this. And Pastor Simpson asked the question this morning, what kind of God does this? Who is this God? He's a God that has a plan. In Genesis 1 to 11, mankind has made a total mess of the world through sin. They've been pursuing themselves. There's pride, there's murder, there's adultery, there's rampant wickedness. We see this today. We're making a total mess of things because we're pursuing ourselves and we're pursuing our own solutions. But God is intervening. God called Abram and he explained his plan of how he, God, would rescue and redeem the broken mess. The gospel is in these verses. Now, you may rightly say, wait, wait a minute, Pastor Dave. What are you talking about? I just read these verses. Matt just read these verses. There's no cross in these verses. There's no Jesus. I don't speak Hebrew, but I don't see Jesus' name anywhere in here. And you're right in that. But turn in your Bibles over to Galatians chapter 3. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. This is amazing. We need to see this. Galatians chapter 3. I got there first, but I cheated. I put a bookmark there. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8 says this. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, now look at these words, in you all the nations shall be blessed. That's quoting Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Paul is expressly saying that God is preaching the, preaching the gospel through Abraham right here. How does that work? Well, what it means is this. Genesis 12, 3 is foreseeing. It's revealing God's gospel plan of blessing all nations through Abraham's future descendant, Jesus, who will die on a cross He'll break the curse of sin. He opens the curtain to forgiveness and reconciliation with God. We sin. We rebel. We doubt. We question. We make a mess of things. Yet God offers to forgive us and restore, to rescue, to redeem, and to reconcile. God has a plan that's stronger and more powerful than any sin any choice, any mistake that we make. Can I say that again? God has a plan that is stronger and more powerful than any sin, than any choice, than any mistake that we make. God is at work. Now you still may be asking, really, how do, how do we know that? How can we be sure? Well, well, let's look at this. Go back to Genesis chapter 12. God said, the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country. First of all, God has a plan. Here's how we can know this for sure. God has a plan. He chose Abram. He didn't choose Terah. He didn't choose Lot. He chose Abram. And, and this is amazing. Joshua chapter 24, I think it's verse 2, tells us that Terah 
He's a pagan. Terah worshipped other gods. Abram did not grow up in a Christian household. From everything that we understand, Abram is not worshipping God at this point. Abram's a pagan. God is calling him. God is choosing Abram, saying, I'm going to work in your life. God chose Abram. God showed him a land. God said, I'm going to send you to a land. Abram did not choose Canaan. God did. God had a plan. God says, I will make you into a great nation. Abram is barren. Sarai is barren. They're 75. In, in verse 4 of chapter 12, we realize Abram is 75 years old, still does not have any children, and God says, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. We actually, if you fast forward... Abram's a hundred when Isaac is born. He had to wait so long for this promise, but God has a plan. And he says, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Not only that, but God will provide. He makes this prom these promises to Abram. He says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. Did God make Abram into a great nation? Yes. yes. He told Abram, he promised him, I will bless you. Did he bless Abram? Yes. He says, I will bless others through you. Is that true? Amen. Yes. And we see it all the way back in Genesis. He blesses Rahab. He, starts, he, he blesses foreigners through the nation of Israel when foreigners bless the Israelites. And now we can see it because we are Gentiles and we've been offered forgiveness as well. He provided a redeemer. He broke the curse. So does God provide? Yes. But we need to understand the provision and the blessing do not mean that it will be easy. Church, please hear me on this. I think there's times that we, we hear God's call and we say, okay, I will obey. And we believe that in that obedience, that then means God owes us an easy path. I think that's a natural tendency, a bent of our hearts. Well, I'm obeying God. Why, why isn't my life easier? But think about Abram's life. Now, God called Abram, says, go to a land I will show you, and I'm going to do all these things for you. God knew, even in the blessing, he says, I will bless you. But what was coming? Was giving birth to Isaac easy for Sarai? I doubt it. It's not easy for young ladies. I can't imagine for a lady in her 90s. The curse is still real. Childbirth was still painful. But not only that, child rearing, raising them, was there conflict in Abram's house? Yes, there was. Ishmael and Isaac, Hagar and Sarai, that was not an easy route. Not only that, God knew slavery in Egypt was coming. There were 400 tough years in Egypt. I'm not done. They wandered around in the desert for 40 years. Then there were wars. People died in conquering the land that God promised to them. Was the path of blessing easy? No, it was not. And so we have to understand, even in obedience, even in God's provision and God's blessing, that does not mean the path is going to be easy. And then lastly, and, and perhaps the most significant, how can I be sure that God is at work? Well, because that he blesses for a purpose. This, at the end of verse two, he says, you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those that curse you. Through you, all the nations of the earth, all the families of the earth will be blessed. God in blessing Abraham. But when I say this out loud, you, it, it's so obvious, but we forget this. God did not bless Abram in the hopes that someday in the future, somebody would paint a really cool picture of an old guy with an amazing white beard. God did not bless Abram, so we would think, man, that dude had an awesome beard, and he had a great life. Like, it, the blessing wasn't about Abram at all. 
Why did God bless Abram? As soon as I say this, we all will say, well, of course that's why. God blessed Abram so that through Abram, others would see God's blessing and come to know him. God blessed Abram so that others would be drawn to God. God was using Abram as a conduit of his blessing to all the world. That has not changed, church. When God blesses us, that he blesses us for a purpose. He wants those blessings to draw others to him. God blesses for a purpose. There's an implied so that in this passage. I will bless you so that others will come to know me. The blessing carries a purpose. And so we've been asking this question. Okay, God, where are you? And my answer is, God is calling and he is blessing. So how does that apply to us this morning? What, we can say, okay, I can see that. He called Abram and he blessed Abram. But what does that mean for us today? Well, let me ask you two questions. First is this. What is God calling you to? My argument is this. The God that called Abram and blessed Abram is the same God today. God is still calling believers. He's still calling people to repent and to follow him. He's calling people to him. And so my question for you today is, what is God calling you to? I can answer this question very clearly and very easily right now. Most recently, God has called me to serve him and to serve our church as faith's lead pastor. I know this. There, there's no question in my mind, this is God's calling right now on my life and on my family's life. We can go back to the last point I just made, or the second to last point. Has it been easy? No. Is God blessing? Oh, yeah. He's absolutely blessing. We can see his provision and his blessing. That doesn't mean it's all that easy. So what is God calling you to? Now, it may be easy for you to think, okay, this is for, this is for young people. This is for our 10-year-olds. This is for our teenagers. One commentary said this. Abram was middle-aged. He was prosperous. He was settled. And he was thoroughly pagan when God called him. Now, one or all of those characteristics may be true of you. I don't know. But God chose to call Abram. He's it. Now, the commentary says middle age. Uh, Abram had already lived a decent amount of his life, hadn't he? He was settled and he was doing well. And God said, I want you to leave. I want you to leave everything that you're comfortable with, and I want you to serve me. Where is he leading you? What does obedience look like in your life right now? I'm being serious, church. I've been on the mission field, and I've seen 70-year-olds show up and bless others. Just because you're retired does not mean that you're on a shelf and God's done using you. It's not true. Is he calling you to missions this morning? Is he calling you to leave, to get out, to go? Is he calling you to a new area of service? Maybe you've been faithfully serving God. And this morning, you can tell right now, he's, he's speaking to your heart. And he's saying, I have a new area of service. I want you to engage. I want you to obey. Are you willing to obey me? Are you in that pathway of obedience already? Have you submitted or are you fighting with him? Are you trying to ignore him? Are you avoiding him? One study Bible reminded me on matters of faith, understanding often follows obedience. The point it's making is this. If God is calling you this morning, you don't need to know all the future steps. We had a missionary just in, in our house this week and he said, so you're not in missions anymore. You're, you're at a church. I said, yes. He said, for how long? Assumption, this is a one or two year thing that, that, no, I don't have to understand all the future. I know God's called me here now and I'm excited and I'm serving. There's no end date to this. 
We don't have to understand the future. We just have to understand the first step of obedience. What is God calling you to today? What's the next step of obedience he wants from you? We just need to take that first step. The second question is, how is God blessing you? What blessings has God given to you that he expects you to be using in the mess right now? We are still living in a sin-soaked, broken world, and it is a mess. But God's at work. How do I know that? Philippians 1.6. He who began a good work in you will be faithful. Carry it on to completion. He's at work. Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship. He's at work. Romans 5, chapter 6, or Romans 5, verse 6 says this. When we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's the gospel. We, God demonstrates his love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We are a mess, but in our sin, Christ died for us, and he's at work. But he didn't die so that we could pray a prayer of forgiveness and then live however we want. He didn't die so that we could ask for forgiveness and then pursue ourselves. He didn't die and then begin to, to bless us when we ask for forgiveness so that we could then just use those blessings for our own comfort and ease. He blesses us so that we can reflect him to a greater extent and point others to him. And so my question for us is what blessings that God has given you are you using right now to point people to him? What blessings are we using as our church? God has blessed our church. So how are we using those blessings to point others to him? As we close, I want to invite you to respond to God. I'm going to come down and stand at the front. And if you would like prayer... If God is speaking to you this morning and you know he is calling you to obey, and it's scary. Church, I've been there. I've been there a few times because there's times that God calls us to obey and we obey. And then in that obedience, he calls us to go someplace else and we have to obey again. And if you're scared, I'd love to pray with you. Maybe you have questions about something that I've shared this morning. I'd love to talk with you. Perhaps you need to, you'd like to find out more about our church. Or if you've been saved but you've not been baptized and you'd like to find out more about baptism, please see me. Please come and see me at the front. And I'd be happy to introduce you to someone who can explain more about our church, about our process of baptism. Pastor Simpson and his family began our service this morning with a, a gripping new song. I love this new song. And it asks crucial questions. Questions that we have sought answers to this morning. Questions such as, what is our hope in life and death? What truth can calm our troubled souls? What holds our faith when we're afraid? Church, we don't need to be afraid about any messes today. The world has been a mess before, and God's at work. He's sovereign. He's taking care of it. We don't need to be afraid about October. We don't need to be afraid about November. God is on the throne, and he's at work, and we can trust him. The question is, will we obey? Will we obey? The gospel is our hope. It's our truth. It's our anchor. He's at work, and we can trust him. Pastor Simpson, can you lead us again? Let's stand together. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? That our souls to Him belong. Who holds our day? comes apart from his command and what will keep us to the end the love of Christ in which we stand oh sing hallelujah our hope springs eternal oh sing
What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good, God is good. Where is his grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above the stormy trial, who sends the waves that bring us nigh, Unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. Unto the grave, what shall we sing? Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him. There we will rise to meet the Lord. Then sin and death will be destroyed. And we will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing Father, we thank you this morning for Christ. We thank you that because of Jesus, we can have hope. Father, help us when we're afraid. Help us when we're uncertain. Help us when we're overwhelmed. Help us when we don't know what to do. Help us to find hope in Jesus Christ. What a blessing he is that you have given to us. We thank you so much, Father, for your love and blessing in our lives today. Help us to rejoice as we leave this place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.